right now. Okay, guys. Um, so we changed platforms. We're on Zoom now. Uh, today is 11.1 for you guys that are taking notes. Uh, Bricky says, I can't hear anything. She's got a... Can you guys hear me fine, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, do me a favor, mute your mics as, as usual, just because we got a pretty good sized group starting here. Um, I want to get through chapter four, which is refrigerants and refrigerant oils. So I'm going to kind of go through a little bit on history of it, uh, what we're evolving as far as refrigerants, a little bit on the service side, uh, a little bit on pricing on this stuff, uh, and like sh and, and shelf keep on a lot of this refrigerant and, and, and oils and stuff like that. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share share my screen here and switch over. Try that one more time. Okay, so let's pull up. Give me just a sec here. I had a ton of windows up. I was in a meeting before we got started. Okay, uh, can you guys see my screen fine? My head yeah, what did you say the topic was? Uh, today is refrigerants and refrigerant oils. We haven't spent much time on this, so uh, I'm gonna get this. I'm gonna get this posted up. I, I made some changes today. I wanted to add a couple of things. Um, so just uh, we'll get through this in just a sec. But what I want to show you guys is your assignment for this week. So let's pull that up really quick. Okay, so as you guys, you got the link, we're all good there. Uh, if you missed last week, basically what I did is I made these little quick little videos over those links, uh, excuse me, those loops that we covered last week. So uh, if you guys still have not got that done, I will, uh, I will still accept those. I want you guys to keep participating, at least with the lecture side, it's things have changed quite a bit. So um, I wanna talk about this first assignment is this AC estimate uh, estimate worksheet that you guys are going to do? Uh, the librarians did a made a big move, and they should have done this years ago. If you guys click on this all data link, all you have to do is put in your NetID and password, and you can get into all data remotely, which is great, so that you guys can have access to this stuff uh, away from Northern. So, our first assignment will be to do this estimate. Uh, preferably on your own rig. It's pretty easy. I've gotten Trenton sent me his already. And then uh, who's the other, somebody else sent me theirs already. Um, but please use the Dropbox under the assignments tab. That'll, that'll keep this smooth operating machine for me. Uh, and this will be due April 5th. So it gives you guys a little bit of time. It's a pretty easy assignment. The next one's going to be a little well, bit. The, go ahead. The link, the link for the all that is that on is that on your Eel and Bright space? Yeah. Are you are you not able to see my screen right now? I I'm seeing it, but it it still says that it's like your desktop is still open or whatever. It just shows me a bunch of your saved stuff. Can you guys see my screen currently right now? I have the no, same. I'm thing still on the Kendall. same. Yeah. Same screen. I just you can see that I'm on the home the home page. No, we're showing no. that you're in documents. Oh. Okay, let me switch. My bad. Let me stop sharing. Sorry, guys. Let me go back to that. I have way too many windows open. How about that? Yep. Okay. That's better. Yeah, I'll just I'll just repeat, guys, right here. I'm just going to try to put everything on the con on the on this announcement page. That'll just keep it, I don't know, a little bit simplified, so you guys aren't clicking as much. But basically, this guy right here will be our link to sign into all data, and then this will be our link for that. Uh, 
it's a Google Doc. So if you guys haven't used Google Docs, it's just like any other documents, pretty straightforward to use. Um, so we should be good there. This next one is a little bit tricky. Um, I had students do a bunch of videos in the past as far as basic stuff. Uh, so for this week's video that you guys are going to do for me is a full AC component identification. So I posted three different videos from three different applications. I did a Kenworth truck, I did a motor grader, and then I did a little John Deere tractor. So if you guys are on the farm or if you're just at your house and you don't have anything but an automotive vehicle, that's fine. Uh, but basically within this form, I'll click on this form. I'm looking for, basically I'm looking for these main items right here that are highlighted. I want you guys to find the refrigerant label. I want you to tell me, hopefully you can identify if it's at least a clutch or a clutchless compressor. Um, the condenser type, that's really easy to identify. Um, some of the stuff might be, if you have a, a TXV, some of that is pretty hard to locate without taking stuff apart. Um, but do your best just to focus on this list of items and see if you can identify them through a video. So this probably shouldn't take you more than three minutes tops. Um, the, the trick here is you have to, you have to post it to YouTube so I can watch it and you can make it unlisted. Um, I know some of you guys maybe haven't used that technology as far as, you know, uploading to YouTube and stuff like that, but it's, uh, it's fairly seamless. Uh, I was able to film these on my phone and literally just you open the YouTube app and upload them to my account. And I can make them, uh, I can make them, or excuse me, you can make them unlisted so that nobody can see them but, but me. And that's kind of the point of this is I want to see if you guys can find these parts on vehicle. You know, we went through the loops and then now I want to see if you can actually find those things on, on vehicles. So I'd really like you guys that are in ag or, or what have you that have like a semi truck or, or a tractor or whatever it is, try to do this on those pieces of equipment just to bring some variety. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty cool to do. So this will be like our first one. We'll just see how it goes. I don't think I have any submissions yet. Um, it's really pretty easy. So it shouldn't be too bad. Um, and then here are the three, the three videos that I made, if you guys want to watch those and help reiterate this stuff a little bit. So those are your two major items this week. And then also your notes, so your notes the video and the estimate. Feel good so far? Yeah, Gucci? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's pretty easy, guys. Um, and you know, you may not get it totally perfect, but it at least gives me an idea if you know you even know where where these parts are. Okay, so I'm going to try to go full screen with this. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yeah. With the service truck. Yep. Okay. Okay. So I just wanted to show you guys a picture of the madness. Um, when you're doing any kind of mobile air conditioning repair. So I've contacted a lot of the shops in the area and nobody has a reclaiming machine. So that makes me think um, there is some illegal practice going on, at least around town. It's probably happening all over the country. Um, one thing I wanted to start with is the concept of venting and how we, how we can reduce it by having this kind of equipment. Um, I've shown you guys the two different bottles. Unfortunately, most of you didn't get a chance to get your hands on that stuff. Um, but there are some major differences between the two, so I'm gonna kinda go through, I'm gonna kinda go through those a little bit, but I just wanna show you guys what it looks like uh, when you're, so this vehicle got a new compressor. You can see the old, the old A6 right here, this is a, uh, I think our early 90s, late 80s vintage tractor. It's a, it, was a, it was a pretty big unit, but the compressor had seized on it. And uh, that guy had me, the guy had me put a new one in. Anyways, um, kind of have all the little pieces. I got my, you know, my gauges up here, my vacuum pump, my reclaimer, and I got the, the, the generator. It's just, this is an example of the madness when I'm working. 
shit is just everywhere. So kind of neat. Thought I'd share that with you guys. Okay. Uh, this is kind of a, yes, sir. What is the main idea for today's notes? Uh, it's, it's over chapter four, which is refrigerants and refrigerant oils. Okay. So I want to ta talk a little bit about the environmental side uh, very briefly, just because it's such a huge uh, topic of, uh, I don't know, some people have opinions <laughs> on this, mixed opinions. It's like, it's like the COVID outbreak, right? Do you believe it or do you not? Uh, it's similar, I think, to some degree. So um yeah i'm uh, i'm I'm literally on page like 43 right now i've got the book in front of me just to kind of follow up on this stuff just to make sure i stay on track i want to spend about a day on this might at this point we could probably bust it out um but i just want to start with this uh just to give you guys kind of a heads up um cfcs or, or chloral floral carbons are the main item that was is is or has been responsible for depletion of the ozone layer. So all the ozone does is help deflect UV rays that hit the, hit the earth every day or throughout the day. When CFCs are released into the atmosphere, they create this thing and I like to call it the Pac-Man effect. It is the, once CFCs are released, they have, an event that happens where when UV light hits these molecules, they will split off and then they're hungry. They're ready to convert into something else. And so what they do in this kind of this second stage is that they attack O3 molecules, which are ozone molecules. The second that that happens, a free oxygen molecule is available and now becomes, uh, let's see, what do you want to call that? chlorine monoxide and then once that happens it just keeps continually eating ozone molecules until it dies so from what i've read in the book and some stuff that i've read online r12 this is a really good stat r12 survives in the in the ozone for 110 years so it can eat up to 100,000 O3 molecules in its lifetime. So what you'll find, um, it's called this dubious factor. There's this, basically there's this hole near the Antarctica, or really it's right above Antarctica, that is causing a lot of our UV rays to come into our atmosphere. So if we, were to continue using CFCs, we would have a gigantic increase in ozone depletion. And so what I'm getting at, kind of the sum of all this, is that we had to come up with another stable refrigerant to replace CFCs. So CFCs were used in like aerosol cans, uh, they're used in, um, what would be another good example? Like air duster cans, like anything that was, uh, held into a container use use cfc to help pressurize the can so it's really uh it was really harmful basically it was a, it was a big ozone depleter um so let me let me continue on i'm going to get to a point uh in a minute here let me pull it up right here so basically if you guys read in the text, when Bush Sr. was in office back in 1990, they came together what was called the Montreal Agreement. And then within this agreement, they said, these 22 countries, man, they said, hey, let's come up with uh, this action plan, this Clean Air Act. If you guys are from California, you know all about the Clean Air Act. We were in the transition where we needed to get out of CFCs and get into something else. So if you can see on the top of the screen, there's these two terms. There's GWP and there's OP, ODP. So if you read the definition on the bottom, GWP compares the ability of different gases to trap heat. And this is based on the heat absorbing ability of each gas. Basically, this value is super, super high. Once it's released, it's able to trap heat. And if we trap heat, 
then it's going to increase the temperature of the earth is what all this comes down to. Um, ODP, which is kind of a really lame, it's a yes and no response, I don't really totally understand, uh, is the amount of effect that a certain chemical has on the ozone layer, which honestly, it's strange that it would be a yes and no uh, criteria, if you will. So basically they're saying, yes, it's a definite depleter of the ozone, but everything else that they've come out with is not ozone depleting. And so what was happening as far as like technicians back in the early 90s is that they had to learn and convert everything from R12 to uh, R134A. So really that R, if you guys think about it, is they're just, they're just calling it refrigerant 12 or refrigerant 134A. Um, it was a big deal. Uh, I'm still doing uh, retrofits. That's what they call it. When you take something and you change it to something else would be a retrofit. Um, and that process is fairly complicated if you want to do it right. Uh, and, I, and I can get into it just for a second. If we backpedal, if we backpedal to this slide here, we have threaded fittings to tap into R12 systems. And so what they came out with is like this coupler setup. This is what you would see with 134A and 1234YF. There's actually adapters that look just like this that will thread onto these old ports so that you can tap in and, and, and give the thing uh, 134A. So really the part of the retrofit process was changing the oil so for years it was it, it was po it was uh, polyester oil. They got rid of polyester oil and they put in uh, PAG oil, polyalkylene glycol. And it's basically if we if we don't change the oil, the refrigerant is not going to carry the the oil with it. So you're gonna you're gonna see a few different terms where they're saying it's uh, it's miscible. It's basically it, it can be carried with the refrigerant or it can be pushed by the refrigerant. Is what you you got to understand like our only moving part is the compressor so if we if we don't allow that oil to move or circulate a little bit then it's going to wear that oil on it also will not coat the the internal lines of all of the components and all the all the tubes of the evaporator and the condenser so it's a really it's a really big it's a really big umbrella so what technicians are starting to find now is are we going to have to convert 134A vehicles to 1234YF? Um, the book is saying no. Um, the reason for that is they have not stopped making 134A. And if you notice, if you read in your text at all in this chapter four, and chapter four is pretty small, uh, it says by 2021, there will be no more vehicles manufactured in the U.S. that have 134A. So currently there is no retrofitting available to convert it to 1234YF. So my question to you guys is, can I put 134A in a 1234YF vehicle? I mean, no. I, if you think about it, if you look at this chart on the left, this is a pressure. This is a pressure temperature chart. It's pretty generic, but it can it shows the two differences. So we've got 134A in like that dark, almost black, and then we've got uh, 1234YF in the red. You can see that we found and discovered and created another refrigerant that is almost ideal in its pressure temperature correlation. Oh, thanks, bro. Appreciate that. <laughs> What's that? Mute your goddamn mic, please, unless you have something to say. Um, oh, is that me? Uh, sounds like it, yeah. Uh -huh. Oops. Sure. How was lunch? Delicious. Um, Don't pass so big. So um, what I'm getting at is, as technicians, or even for myself, I want to get into 1234YF. The problem is, it is so... <laughs> God damn expensive. So I want to backpedal a little bit here. Um, are we all good? Can everybody, Cole, are you on your phone? You might've muted already. Yeah, I'm on my phone. 
Can you see what we're going through right now on the screen? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so I was at I was at CarQuest the other day. Sucky. Yeah, I was really curious to see what they had for pricing. My my pricing I could get on this stuff. I went through this a little bit, but I guess a good note for you guys is this was the same cost analysis that they had when they moved. When we moved from R12 to 134A, R12 was super cheap and 134A was really expensive. It's like anything, right? You, you, you buy a new vehicle, um, your old one's not worth anything, but the new one's obviously super expensive. It's got all this technology, this, that, and the other. The big difference between these two uh, containers, if you will, is that 134A, when you guys get your Section 609 uh, certificate, you can own, you're able to buy any, any size cylinder you want. The image on the right is anything you can buy at Walmart. So I have mixed opinions about all this stuff uh, as far as what's available at Walmart. Yeah, you mean you can hook up in there and add a refrigerant, that's all good, but like that's not always your problem. So it's a little frustrating when people get those cans out and start filling it up and and all that good stuff. And I guess on this third on this second to the bottom shelf is you can get refrigerant that has a sealer in it which is extremely harmful, harmful to your equipment. Um, I don't have a sealant tester. I have one at the school. It's actually a really pretty expensive tester. It's, anyways, I'm not going to get into it too much. Uh, but what I am getting at is these cylinders of this 1234YF, this is only 10 pounds. So if you buy two or more, you get it for 600 bucks. Basically, you get it for 60, 60 bucks a pound. Um, if we do the math, 30 pounds divided by 100, it'd be three bucks a pound for 134A. So there's like this giant um, transitional period that we're in where it's 1234YF is going to get cheaper, but unfortunately it hasn't changed very much since I started doing air conditioning. The prices have been almost the same for both refrigerants. Um, the one below it is also interesting too. It looks like the same size can, but the 134A can is only 12 ounces. The 1234YF is only eight ounces. So if you buy these, it's a hundred bucks a pound to have this 1234YF refrigerant. Um, I think I told you guys this already, but Dodge, Dodge charges for an evacuation recharge charges $900 to do a recovery, evacuation and recharge for 1234YF. So it is a huge market. The equipment's really not that expensive. Like you can get a machine for like five grand ish. Sure, the bottles are kind of expensive, but if you're if you're getting paid, let's just say that you bought the equipment and it, you know, however many times. Usually the the idea is if you use a use a piece of equipment ten times, will it pay its, you know, it should pay itself off within ten times is what I'm getting at. So if I got this $700 bottle of refrigerant and then I got this $5,000 machine, it's going to pay itself off if you touch this refrigerant. So that's the problem is it's not in every vehicle, but most vehicles made from probably 16 to now, I would say probably 30 or 40% of them are 1234 YF. So Ben, Ben brought over that swather I don't know, maybe it was about third week, fourth week into the semester, and we were taking a peek at it, and it's 1234YF. So I don't even have the service equipment yet here at the school, but that's a big system. You know, that's a four-pound system. So that $900, we're talking more probably like twelve dollars or 1300 So I'm really curious to see kind of this transition, but I really want to get into it. <laughs> the problem is you can get, you can get gauges, I mean, you still have the vacuum pump. The problem is, is you need to get a dedicated cylinder just for this refrigerant. Another thing is, is if you're going to tap into a system like this, you have to know what refrigerant's in there. That's when that refrigerant identifier comes into play. So uh, does anybody have questions so far? I do. Okay. So if you have an old set of 134.8 gauges, 
and you have a PT chart, why can't you use your 134A gauges for one, two, three, four, whatever the other one is? I can't remember. Yeah, it's okay. It just it's it's one, two, three, four YF. Okay. So for you, so if you take a peek at the screen, all they've done to reduce the chance of you hooking up your coupler ends is that this brand, this brass on the right is is that 1234YF. They've necked, they've necked down the high side. And what they also did is they made it one millimeter wider on both of the couplers. So now they're 14 millimeter and 17 millimeter. So you literally cannot put your 134A um, coupler ends on. But here, let me tell you this. You can buy one, two, three, four YF couplers and screw them into your hoses. Do you see where I'm going with this? Yes. You could fill a 1234YF system with 134A by simply converting the hose ends. Yeah, because I know you can take your R12 and your 134A gauges and run them side by side because most of those gauges, when both of them were out at this time, had both gauges on it or you just knew your PT chart difference and converted it. Yes. So I have one set of gauges that has uh r22 410a those are residential mm -hmm. r12 and 134a all on one gauge yes so you probably you just have different hose like see the thing is like what uh what cole's getting at here is that we had to thread on to these and they changed they basically changed the sizes but in the late 80s you'll find that in the section six to nine third so you all you need to do is get different different coupler ends because all they do is screw into the end of the hose i have not done it yet you guys I have not tried to fill a 1234 yf vehicle with 134a i just haven't done it yet but i want to do it and charge it to the exact same size and see if it works because technically if we go back to this chart it's close but once you start getting into those 200, I mean, not even 200, about, mm, yeah, maybe like, I don't know, is that maybe about two, maybe like 190? About 190 PSI, they start splitting off. So really, your pressure is higher in a 134A system than a 1234YF. So, I, I mean, it's, in my opinion, um, it's exciting that we're moving to a new but it's terrifying how expensive it is. So this is the other point I wanted to get at you guys is, oh, let me go back here, is hydro hydrofluorocarbon or this 134A refrigerant still has a fairly significant GWP or its ability to trap heat. So they considered that too high and they said, they said, we have to find something better. And so that's when they came out with 1234YF. So the next one that they want to introduce is R744, which is all CO2 based. The problem with it is that it is seven times, a seven times greater pressure than 134A. So harnessing a, a compressor that can handle that pressure, lines that can handle that pressure, and, and evaporators and all that good stuff. It's more of a fuel cell equipped vehicle will have CO2. You guys mute your mics. Vehicles. Yeah, please mute your mics. Um, so what I'm getting at in this whole environmental part of it is that manufacturers have recognized that See, uh, uh, R12 is shit. It's actually a really, really good refrigerant when it's contained. But when you when you take that beast out, it puts holes in the ozone. Okay, so they got rid of it. I still have cans right here. I've got four of these right here. So this is how old it is. If you look at the date on this, if you guys know Pomida, you've been living in Montana long enough. This was sold or at least put on the shelf of February 8th of 1984. So it's, they are old cans of R12. I bought them for eight bucks a piece. And I have a, my, my, uh, my dolphin is one of the last years of R12. So I'm keeping these babies for it. You can see it says refrigerant 12 in the background. Um, 
if you guys get your hands on this stuff, it's going for this 12 ounce can's gone about 35 bucks on eBay. So it's not a bunch of money, but it's still around. Don't ever get rid of it. It's it's gold, baby. Keep the gold. I mean, they kept it all the way up until my truck, at least, because my truck's a stock 91. Yeah, I think the book says is a 94 Subaru Justy was the last year that they put it in, put it in vehicles. So yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, um, it's a kick-ass refrigerant, you guys. It's too bad that we had to move away. It's it was more stable. It, the molecules were bigger. So that's another thing I wanted to discuss, kind of throw this all together, is that um, R12, the actual physical molecules are larger than 134A. So one of the problems or one of the things that you run into when you convert from 12 to 134 is that you need to install barrier hoses that have an additional liner on the inside of the refrigerant hose. If you don't do that, then your 134A permeates out of the hose. So a lot of guys, if they've done that conversion, they mainly just put those, put screw on those couplers that go on to, that go on to the old service ports. They change the oil and the compressor and they charge it up. That is not the recommended way of doing it. You should change the hoses. You should change the low side switch. You should flush all of the components that you can. So it's a really sensitive subject. Um, your success is, is there if you try to convert it. It's just a tricky beast. So like I said, like my old Dolphin camper is still R12. I'm going to keep it R12 for as long as I can. Um, let's see uh, what else I want to say. Um, one thing that uh, manufacturers have done when they came out with the 1234YF system is that they needed to have that IHX to, we wanted to reduce the charge size. So you can see that this label is uh, basically 0.62 kilograms and there's 2.25 kilograms to a pound. Um, it's a really small charge. And so the only way to get that efficiency up there is if we install that IHX. Another thing is, is that you can see the fire symbol on here. Ref one, uh, excuse me, 1234YF is slightly flammable uh, under some seriously odd conditions. They sprayed it onto a hot exhaust manifold and it would not ignite, but they put like power steering. I've watched this video. They put power steering on there and, and uh, and oil and all these lit on fire. So they have considered this slightly flammable. And so the major change that they did is that they made the evaporators about a third thicker than they did with 134A vehicles. Because they don't want to risk the chance of that thing leaking and then igniting the internal portion of the cab. So in my opinion, it's a little overkill. But it's a sorry. What did they make thicker? It cut out right when you said that. That's okay. Um, the evaporators inside the cab they made them thicker. Literally, they just added more material to them, so that they would reduce the chance of them leaking and and causing a in cab explosion, basically. Thanks. In, in a nutshell, you bet. Um, so the big difference is if you see this white bottle with a red stripe, you know that that's 1234YF. If you see the big blue bottle, then you know it's 134A. So nothing too foundational here. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was this DOT bottle. Now this is the one that I use to recover into and then charge from. Um, you guys, when we were here together, um, they have that float on there. So once we get above 80%, we are going to risk the chance of the cylinder exploding when the temperature increases. So if I'm 90% full and it reaches 150 degrees, it will explode. So luckily, Montana, I keep my bottles inside the rear portion of the service body and it's white, you know, so the, the temp, I've measured the temp in there and it's a little bit higher than ambient, but it's never been hot enough to experience this explosion of 150 degrees, basically would cause explosion. Um, 
all I'm getting at on this is that these DOT bottles are reinforced. They have that tube that goes to the bottom of the can. They, um, let's see, what was I going to say on that? Is that they, hold on, I'm thinking about it. Um, I tried to overfill it once because I was, I only had one bottle and I was away from town and I actually tipped it to its side to get it to refill more. And uh, it was really risky business, but never overfill these cylinders and never try to fill a cylinder uh, like those 30 pounders that you buy at the store that cannot handle being recharged. I believe you can put refrigerant into them and out of them, but they're not built to be uh, refilled like that is what I'm getting at. So uh, nothing too groundbreaking there. Uh, I'm just backpedaling, just making sure I got all that covered. Uh, any questions on this stuff so far? Um, when you guys do the section 609 exam, it re it reemphasizes a few of these points that we've talked about already, like the Clean Air Act and certain things about the refrigerant. So, so keep in mind that um, the section 609 gives you the ammo to um, buy any refrigerant larger than two pounds. Um, Hayden, Jeske, he already completed the exam. Uh, I think he missed one. He said it was pretty straightforward. Um, I put a due date on that on April 16th. So my recommendation to you guys is just constantly check on Brightspace, look in the assignment Dropbox. A lot of that stuff that we're doing is we're utilizing that tool. So it shouldn't be too bad. Um, there are more details on 1234YF on page 46 if you guys want to read more about that. Um, the last thing I want to get into is, is the oil that we put in the system. So uh, can you guys see me at all? Or are you just, you're just seeing the screen, is that correct? I see both, both are. Okay. Um, so our refrigerant oil, and I want you guys to, there are three types, this would be a good bullet point. There are three types of refrigerant oil. So the first one, is mineral oil. So think about this as ester oil. Well, similar to ester oil, polyester oil is, is a little bit different, but this mineral oil was used specifically for R12 system because it was compatible with R12. The one that we use that's most common is PAG, P-A-G, polyalkylene glycol. Now this refrigerant oil comes in three different viscosities. So I'm looking on page 51 for you guys that are um, trying to follow along on this. Those viscosities, the lower the number, the lower the viscosity. So we've got a 46 low viscosity. We've got a 100, that's a medium viscosity. And then we've got a 150, that is high viscosity. So if you look at these oils, and I have them in front of me in the office, it's a little bit hard to see. Let me just stop sharing for a second. You guys take a peek at these. It's really hard to tell, but PAG, let's see, this is PAG 46, is really clear. Oh, let's move this guy over. The 100 is a little bit more, uh, has a little bit more color to it. And then the 150 is really, is really quite a bit darker. It's kind of hard to see on camera. And then what I did is I brought up a bottle of dyed oil. My recommendation to you is most manufacturers say it's okay to use the dyed oil. So when in doubt, buy dyed PAG oil. And don't buy a big one like this unless you do what I do. If you guys are just servicing your own vehicles, get the little guys. Because this is an eight ouncer. For most systems, this is all a vehicle needs. It would be a would be an entire bottle. So uh, I'm gonna get into it more, but basically we're divvying that oil up. We're gonna give a little bit to each component and then the majority of it is gonna go to the 
uh, to the compressor. So I have this 70, go ahead. If you buy a big bottle, can that stuff go bad? Uh, ben, that's a great question. That brings up my next point is just like brake fluid, PAG oil is hygroscopic, which means that it generally speaking can absorb moisture over time. Um, so my recommendation to you is don't let it sit on the shelf for more than six months once you've opened it. Try to use it up. Um, this is another really good note um, that I want you guys to put down. This is a big service point of all this. You never want to take PAG oil and lubricate any fittings or O-rings with because when you get water and PAG oil mixing on aluminum, it'll actually corrode the aluminum. So you actually need to use ester oil as a lubricant. It will not corrode externally on your components, if that, if that makes sense. So I've got one of those, I don't have it in front of me here, but I've got one of those oil pumpers. You can buy at North 40, you, you, they unscrew and they got a little dongle on it and a little, a little teeny hose. I use those to apply a little bit of ester oil um, onto the O-rings when I'm installing them. So never use PAG oil as a lubricant for your O-rings. It's a, it's a bad move, so don't do it. I'm gonna switch back to the uh, sharing content here really quick. Okay. Um, so if you are replacing a compressor and you tip it over and you spill oil, you really, not that you spill oil. What I'm getting at is if you replace a compressor, you should drain the oil into a um, measured cylinder, like a Pyrex. I, I have a, I have a eight ounce Pyrex um, little pitcher thing, if you want to call it that, one of those glass ones. I will pour the oil into there and then visually inspect to see if it falls into these four categories. Most of the time it's gonna be worn out and it's gonna be amber looking. Uh, you may have it yellow. Uh, it's a little bit hard to tell uh, right off the bat, but usually it'll be pretty discolored. So from this chart, uh, I pulled this from AP Air, this really good air conditioning website. Um, if it's a really ambery kind of chalky, your copper is probably going to come from a condenser or evaporator. And that's not the case on all evaporators, but I've been seeing more and more ag equipment that has brass tubing for the evaporators. So if those start to degrade um, from moisture, a lot of this contamination guys is when you get air, refrigerant and oil making a baby, they make acid. So when that happens, it'll start munching up uh, Teflon O-rings as the black indicates, um, which they're not really telling you a whole lot there. If you have black oil, you are in serious danger of blowing up that compressor again. So I had a customer that threw a new compressor on, he didn't put any oil in it, and then it, uh, and then it grenaded again in a month and it was totally black. So what I had to do is replace everything but the condenser, and I'm gonna get way more into that stuff when we get into it, but if you visually inspect the oil, it'll, it'll at least give you a really good general sense of the condition of, rest, of the rest of the components. So this is just a good little heads up. Uh, always inspect the oil if you can. Once the refrigerant's pulled, you should be good from there, so. Hey, Holsworth. Yes, sir. With the different viscosities for the PAG oil, what would you, like, what are the different viscosities? What would you see the different viscosities in different applications? Like, what would you use the 150 in and that kind um, of thing? So for you guys that are in heavy duty, I would say 60% of the stuff that I looked at utilized a Sandin compressor. So if you guys watch my video on that Kenworth truck, it had a Sandin compressor. It's a, 
it's a swash plate compressor. It's a piston compressor with double ended pistons and they are commonly using PAG 100. If you, if you use the incorrect viscosity, you're going to cause premature drag or free, if you will, kind of free wheeling of the compressor. So if you use a high viscosity when it requires a low, you're probably talking about tighter tolerances. Like a 46 PAG oil would be something you would see more or less in a scroll or a vein compressor. But if you're dealing with something that has double-ended pistons, like a scotch, a scotch yoke compressor or um, a wobble plate or a swash plate, they're usually that 100 or 150. I would say when in doubt, use 100. If you absolutely do not know, try to use 100. Because you're, you go from 46 to 150, it's a pretty broad, the spectrum is pretty broad. I mean, this, this 46 is really watery. And if you shake the, the bottle of 150, it is thicker. It's, it's actually substantially thicker. Um, always call, or I don't know, Googling is tough, but try to look up. Like if you're working on a piece of ag equipment, um, let me pull up that. Let me pull up this other thing. Can you see my blink screen right now? Yeah. It'll usually tell you when you buy a new compressor what you need for it, doesn't it? Well, if you buy a new compressor, it may have shipping oil or it may be fully charged with the oil that it needs. So it all depends on where you bought it and what directions that they give you. Um, this is a really, you guys that are in heavy duty diesel, this is, this is the best website that I've found that provides you with some general specs for pictures um, of parts, part price, not part prices, but part numbers, um, all the different variations. Like, I mean, you guys are seeing, I don't know, maybe up to six different engines and some Peter Biltz and Kenworths. I mean, that's another thing is you got to get the model number off the motor when you call Napa, because Napa is like my heavy duty, my source for heavy duty parts. He always wants model number of engine so that he can cross reference it so that you get the right compressor. Otherwise, what you got to do is pull the damn compressor, bring it in and have him identify it. They all have basically the back of a sanded compressor has different head different cylinder heads on the back of it, which could have thread on adapters. They could be a manifold bolt style. So they're all different, but this is a really kick-ass website, apairinc.com. Um, for those of you who have like trouble finding parts for heavy duty stuff, give this one a look up. It's, it's pretty good. I had Shay and I remember Shay and Trevor and, and Ben, we were looking up, I think we were looking up some ag equipment on here and we struggled to get, a little bit on charge size and, and, and a couple of those things, but generally speaking, it's pretty good. So um, let me, I'm gonna conclude our lecture today by saying uh, we are fairly good to go on, I think the refrigerant as a whole. We just gotta do safe practices uh, handling this refrigerant. I'm gonna go over a couple of things next class. I wanna wrap it up. Uh, so if there's any, any dying questions out there, ask them now or I'm gonna, I'm gonna cancel the, uh, the, the lecture for today. So can you guys still hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, so part of the reason that Napa wants you with Bob to pull off AC compressors and bring it in is because you get a perfect example of 855 Cummins or the 400 big cams. They're used in so many different applications that there's different cooling systems. There's different AC compressor systems. The other day I had a gentleman come in with an 855 Cummins. It was an ag engine, but he pulled the truck engine out and put it in his uh, baler. So what he needed was an AC compressor, but I had to look it up for a truck, not for an AC baler for an ag. Oh, system. right. So that's also one reason why heavy duty is so scarce why heavy duty is so hard to find is because cummins and caterpillar detroit puts their engines in so many different things to use to have everything available to them 
and maybe one AC compressor is smaller than another or one evaporator is different. So sure. they all have to change. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing is you're, if you go from a, from what I've seen, if you go from a, uh, just a day cab to a sleeper, you're going to have a bigger condenser. So paying attention to like that small detail and even measurements, like a lot of this stuff, um, they could be side mounted. They could be, they could be top, top bolted, top bolt mounted. I mean, there's so many, there's so many variations to all these different compressors. So once we get into that, you guys will, I have all these teardowns of these compressors on these boards. So I'll show you guys a lot of different variations that you guys will see. So, yeah, uh, I think, uh, let me just take a peek at this really quick. We should be good on chapter two, chapter four. Um, I think we'll get into the components chapter five. Uh, we'll, we'll start that on Thursday and we should be good. That'll, that'll take us a little while. I want to get through, really hit you guys on those details. So this PowerPoint that I went through, I made some changes today. I'm going to uh, upload it, replace the one that's in there right now. So you guys have something a little bit newer. So uh, I'm curious to see your guys' notes today. So if you have a chance, take a picture of them, put them in the Dropbox and, uh, and we'll be good from there. Is there anything specific you want us to have in our notes? Like, cause it's really hard to take notes off of the PowerPoint without like, you know, cause we're so used to going off the board and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have that many notes other than like the things that you said. Sure. Right down, which um, is only like five or six things. Yeah, that's fine. Basically you guys are, you know, since the whole dynamic of college has changed, I just want you guys to view this as a, and I'm viewing this as more of a participation in these lectures than anything else. Um, like your notes the other day, Sam, were really good. Just try to not overdo it, right? I want you guys to do no more than a page on a lot of this stuff. So it should be those main, I emphasize a lot of different things today. So those are the ones that I'm really concerned that you guys retain as those really important facts. Like knowing that uh, chlorine molecules, when they break up and start eating O3 molecules, yeah, that's important, but it's not like, I don't want you to draw that in your notes. You see what I'm saying? Like put down the things that you find valuable to you is what I'm getting at. Okay, sounds good. So Thank if that's you. five things, put it down, send it in. All right, sounds good. Super, thank you. What was the third type of min uh, oil? I have mineral oil and pag oil, but you didn't. Yeah, the uh, last time is PO. It's poly polyester oil. That's the one that, generally speaking, is compatible with both R12 and 134A, but it is not widely used like pag oil is. Okay, that's all I needed. You bet. Sorry, I, I think I probably jumped the gun. There's just a lot to this, and I wanted to get through it today. Yeah, we should be good. Are we still going to have, like, a final? Um, I'm probably going to give you guys – you are going to get a final, but it's probably going to be a little bit different than I, did, than I do traditionally. Um. Like I said, I'm gonna introduce a bunch of different assignments. Like I'm really curious to see how you guys do on your own, identifying these parts, um, doing the quizzes, you know, this sort of thing, uh, participating in lectures. So we'll kind of see how it goes, but yeah, we're gonna have probably a light, a light final. It's okay. different guys, everything has changed and I'm trying to adapt as much as I can. It's been really tough coming up with all these different assignments. I built this. I mean, this is the 10th time I've taught this class. So I'm like, I got to dial in. Now I've got to redial the whole damn thing. And uh, it's been, it's been tough, but no, that's a good question. I'll keep you guys uh, fully informed of what we're doing. Cool. Thank you. You bet. I'll stick around for a few minutes. If you guys have more questions. Adios. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. So for the notes <clears throat> that I missed the week before, can I just go through, review the, uh, 
the video that you recorded and then submit some notes? Yes, so let me, let me buzz over here. That's fine, Levi, I know uh, everybody's, I've had I, plenty of other people struggle, so you're not alone. Let me, let me push. 10.2 notes, but I forgot to upload them and it's yeah, closed let, already. Yeah, let me, let me open it up because I don't want you to email it to me. I'd just rather it be in here. So I'll have it due tonight, 11.30 p.m. for both 10.2 and 10.1. Yeah, I made three videos or five videos, three of them for the first day, two for the second day. I was really bummed that stupid WebEx is just such junk. This is such a better, such a better platform. So this should work. So I extended those two dates for tonight, 11.30 p.m. You need to be better than Zoom in person. What's that? You know, be better than Zoom in person. Zoom is the bomb, man. This thing is so easy. It's a piece of cake. Yeah, yeah but we could just do a lab in person. Oh, yeah, what God, are we doing I'm for labs? To, what I'm, I mean, what I'm putting you guys, having you guys do these. Just those videos. Do that video and do that estimate worksheet. I'm going to slowly kind of add different types of, of work. I mean, you guys just can't, you can't do much for refrigerant. You know, you can't touch it. You can't. You don't have the equipment, you don't have the space. So really this is what we're doing, if you will. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, likely do a little bit of live stuff uh, a little bit later on. Like I've got this, I've got this Kenworth that needs a condenser. So I was just gonna go through like how I troubleshot. I did the troubleshooting on it. I don't know, they might be totally closed out. I haven't called them yet, um, but I've got the part for it a couple of parts for it. I was just going to kind of walk through. I think I could literally have this set up and show you guys the repair process. It should be pretty, pretty straightforward, yeah. you know, getting the machine I, out and going through all that. I really could have used the shop uh, last week. I had to replace my struts and wheel bearing assemblies on my Acadia. Oh, wow. It was quite a process to do in my garage. I'm sure. Yeah. That's a little, that's a backbreaker right there. Yeah. Okay, so now the estimate worksheet, that's on Brightspace too? Yep, it's on the announcements area. Okay, so get those done. And is that something that we do on our own vehicle, kind of a yep. parts kind estimate? Like, okay. Yeah, just like we did in uh, heating and cooling. Uh, if you want to do your video on your Acadia, or do you have um, any other applications you can do it on? Uh, 2014 Dodge pickup. Yeah, that'd be cool. Body. You can do it on that. Just watch those okay. videos that I made. They're pretty straightforward. On like yeah, the Acadia would be kind of a pain in the butt because there's so many cowling anything. and shit under there to remove. Yeah, you can't, you can't see anything. Yeah. That wouldn't be a very good one. Okay. Well, thanks yeah. a lot, man. All right. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Yep. Bye. Later, Matt. See ya. What about the rest of you turkeys? Who else is here? Koss, Newman. And probably signed off. Hayden, are you good? Are you good? I have a question. Sure. You said that 20 to 30 percent are what kind of systems? I say one thing that we've what, 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 what I'm starting to see is basically in the last five years, mm -hmm. I would say probably 30 percent of the vehicles that are out there have this new refrigerant installed in the system. Okay. It's coming around. It's coming fast. That's and, uh, the what was that? That was R. That's a one, two, three, four YF. Okay, I, got, I was making sure I got that. So. Sure. So all that part that you showed us with all the refrigerants, what was? There was the one fifty two, I think. What was that used for? That's a that's a heavy, not a heavy duty. That's a in dust. Um, that's a residential refrigerant. Oh, that's just kind of a generic chart. I just had it had all of them up there. Okay. Um, let me see if I have that. Yeah, let me get this loaded up for you guys so you can see if you want to backpedal and look at this stuff. Okay, guys, if there's nothing else.